Acts 2.14 says, Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. And I want to preach for a while this morning for the subject, Listen Carefully, Part 2. Father, we thank you for this time together this morning. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us. Lord, your word tells us it is living and it is active. So God, we pray that it will be living and active indeed in our lives, that we would, as Peter said, listen carefully. Lord, to hear your words and to understand what it means to us as a church body, how we go about being the body of Christ in this, in this area, in our communities, and in this time. We are still in the time of the New Testament church. So God, we have instruction here that we can learn and understand today, and hopefully we'll be empowered by your spirit to live it out. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As I, as I said, this is, uh, we've been talking about the church, what the church is, the church body, how it's important to, that we gather together regularly, that we make, we make up the church body. But then, once we understand that we are the church, well, what does that mean? How do we go about being the church? What is God's intent for us? And so I read this last week, and I was struck by this, where Peter says, listen carefully. Because we're going, what's going on here? What, what's happening on this day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit is being poured out? And he says, well, I'm going to tell you. So listen carefully to what I tell you. And I mentioned last week, it's, I'm still always amazed that after 2,000 plus years, people are still debating what this means. What this, what this day of Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was all about. When Peter says, if you'll listen up, I'm going to tell you what this means. I, I guess they weren't listening carefully. They didn't hear him say that because he makes it pretty clear. But I'm going to tell you. So we see as he begins to begins to lay it out, the New Testament church was obedient. That, that's where they started off. Jesus tells them what to do, and they do it. He gives them instruction for how to go about replacing Judas, and he start, tells them you know, how to get organized and how to conduct business and all of these things that are very important. He explains to them what the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was that day when they heard the sound as a mighty rushing wind and the tongues of fire that came and rested upon each person there, signifying that God's presence was moving into their lives, and they began to speak in these tongues. And he says, hey, you know, this didn't that, that would be confusing. Had, if anybody had been there that day, would you have been going, what in the world's going on? We all would have, right? So Peter says, well, I'm going to tell you what it is. This is what Joel prophesied about. And he goes and he references and quotes Joel's prophecy. And Joel's prophecy, without getting into it and reading it, is very much about supernatural, miraculous things taking place in people's lives and and through people's lives that make up the church. So he's explaining to them, Joel prophesied this day was coming when God's spirit would move supernaturally in people and in his people and what they would do because of the supernatural presence of the Holy Spirit. And he says, that's what this is. It's starting today. And then he goes on and he gets into where he's quoting uh, Jesus in Matthew 24 when his disciples come to him and say, what is, you know, what is the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And he quotes how Jesus answered them. So Peter sets a time frame. Joel's prophecy is starting today and it's going to last until this, this question that Jesus answered, what's the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So we're not at the end of the age yet, amen? We're still here. That means we are within that time frame. That's why it's even more important that we listen Carefully, And the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is specifically for the New Testament church. Where we're told in Acts 1-8, the, when the Holy Spirit is poured out, you receive power. Power to what? Power to be a witness to the, you know, your own local community, to the ends of the earth. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So that is the purpose of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. God is going to use us in a supernatural way. That is what he expects. Now, whether or not we are doing that, that's kind of on us. But that's God's intent. God intends to empower us with his spirit to be able to proclaim the gospel message to the very ends of the earth. That's, that's for us. We can read that and say, well, that was written 2,000 years ago. Yes, it was. And it was written for us today because we still live within the time frame that Jesus laid out. Amen? Is there any confusion about that? I... I have to 
tell a little uh, story on this. To me, this is just, maybe I'm just slow enough that I don't know any better. I'm just going to read my Bible and let it say what it says, and I'm going to believe it. But I actually had one of our denominational leaders I was sharing this with. And this, I, I love this man, but, but we all have our limitations by what we've been taught over time. And, I, and some of our folks have trouble with the whole idea of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues and all that kind of stuff. And so I showed them this passage. I said, look, right here, Peter says what's happening is this is what Joel prophesied about. It's starting today. And I go, oh, yeah, yeah, I see. That's what he's saying. And then I referenced the Peter quoting Jesus in Matthew 24 about the signs coming in the end of the age. I said, see, there's a time frame that has been set here. And during that time frame, that outpouring of the Holy Spirit and Joel's prophecy, we are in that time frame. And their response was, uh, I'll have to study that. Meaning, yeah, that's crystal clear, but it goes against everything I've always been taught and believed. That's what that, that's what that answer was, right? Just, we need to not have that response. We need to see what it says and go, yep, that's what it says. I guess that's talking for me. I guess I better be, I better, I better be purposeful and intentional about being that. I better be purposeful and intentional about being the New Testament church carrying out what Joel prophesied we were supposed to be all about, what we were supposed to be doing, and not, not just go, uh, I'll have to study that. It's probably wrong of me to chuckle with that, but I can't help it. The Bible makes, you know what I like about the Bible? God's Word, it makes me way smarter than I really am. <laughs> so it's kind of fun. Let's look at Acts 2. Sorry, verse 22. I'm going to read to verse 28. Acts 2, 22. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you uh, by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death. But it is impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life and will fill me with your joy in your presence. The first thing that I'm struck by this in verse 22, it says Jesus, uh, 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 Peter states this Jesus, this man, Jesus of Nazareth, he was a, he's accredited to you by God. In other words, God proved who he was. Proved who he was, what his position was, what his job was, what he came to do. He was accredited to you by God. God did this. What did God do? How did he accredit him to you? He proved that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah, the promised Savior, the Son of God, because he empowered him to do what? Miracles and wonders and signs. In other words, how did they know that Jesus was the promised Christ, the promised Messiah? Because he did miracles and wonders and signs. And so this is very much related, though, to, okay, this is related to Joel's prophecy. Because Joel describes that we are going to do what? Miraculous things, supernatural things. God accredited Jesus to the world by him doing supernatural things. Joel said 
I'm gonna, God's going to pour out his spirit on the church, and you're going to know it. In other words, you're going to, the, the church will be accredited to the world by causing them to be able to do supernatural things. Now, if I'm, would anybody like to disprove what I just said? I mean, I'm not saying that I'm going around doing miracles all the time. What I'm saying is that God's word says that that's what he's doing. He wants to do. That's Joel's prophecy. Our problem, our, cha our challenge isn't um, knowing what we should be doing. The Bible tells us our challenge is being confident that God does want us to do those things. And at least being willing to be used in that way. I mean, I, I, I can't explain why we don't see as many miracles as we seem to in the Bible. Although I will say this, I believe the Bible is this condensed. It's like, it's like um, how many of you have, a, you have a favorite musical band or singer? And over the years, they've released lots and lots of songs and albums. Although, do, we have, do they do albums anymore? Is that the way music is done? Yeah. Okay, you you but okay, you know what I mean, okay? But every now and then they go around and they do what? And if you, if you and usually we go and we buy them, we get the best of or the greatest hits, right? The Bible is basically in the New Testament, Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the apostles, it's their greatest hits condensed into a you know because we know that look. I'm going a whole different direction than what I intended here this morning, all right? But I think this is important. I really, really want us to get this. It's clear that the Bible tells us that we receive God's empowerment of the Holy Spirit so that we can do supernatural, right? We're clear on that. But yet we feel like we don't do as much as we see in the Bible. Do we agree on that? We are told by John in the book of Revelation, that if all the things that Jesus did was recorded, the world would not be able to hold all the books. Okay? So, that means what? That means this is Jesus' greatest hits. And the apostles and the Holy Spirit. In other words, this is the very best this is the supernatural. This is the miraculous. This is the powerful. The stuff that, you know, that's in here. There's a whole lot of things that I'm guessing that the apostles did, the church did, that Jesus did, that were wonderful and incredible and brilliant and insightful and, and loving and gracious and merciful and compassionate, but they're not recorded here, and they might not have been something like the dead being raised. Or blind eyes being opened. But he still did them. They just weren't that. So we should not beat ourselves up excessively that we don't do all miracles every day like we see in this book. You understand? Do you understand what I'm saying? There's a whole lot that I believe that because of what John writes in Revelation, I believe there's a whole lot that that Jesus and the church did that it's not all in the realm of like the, the dead being raised, all right? But they still did them, and it was still God, and it was still good, and it was still wonderful and necessary. We can do all that stuff every day, but we should still believe for and hopefully try and expect God to also, when he sees appropriate, to do the supernatural. We shouldn't be closed off to that. We shouldn't be closed off to either. We shouldn't be closed off to giving a, giving a cup of cold water in Jesus' name or visiting someone who's in prison or in the nursing home, okay? Those don't sound miraculous unless you're the person getting the cup of water or the visit. We shouldn't be closed off to either. We should be seeking to do both. Those kind of things, the cup of cold water, those kind of And also, if God... Desires and it's time for him to do something supernatural. I'm cool with that too. Am I am I making sense here this morning? So 
it is a form, according to, to Peter, of God accredited Jesus to the world because he did miraculous things through him. And Peter says that the church is going to do miraculous things as well. That was Joel's prophecy. Operate in the supernatural. I believe that that is God's way, just like Jesus accrediting us to the world. Well, I'm, I'm good with that. God wants, I believe, to accredit the church to the world. We should be wanting to be accredited to the world. David states in verses 25 through 28, as it, he speaks as if it's, him, he, it's himself, he's speaking, and uh, he's, he goes on and he's speaking about um, what he says in verse 25, David said about him. When he says David said about him, who's the him? It's Jesus, right? And he goes on and he talks about Jesus, um, who is his descendant. In the lineage, Jesus is a descendant of David. And, and David talks about this Jesus that will become, that will be his descendant, and will be the promised Messiah. Obviously, this is hundreds of years before Jesus is born. So let's go on and see what David has to say about Jesus in verse 29. He says, Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David, and this, of course, is Peter speaking, David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Now he's going to refer to Jesus. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. This is what David prophesied about his descendant Jesus. He wouldn't be abandoned to the grave, he wouldn't see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact, exalted to the right hand of God, and he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. So David is calling Jesus his Lord. Okay? Verse 35, until I make your enemies a footstool for your seed. So he here is saying that David, you know, he's still in his tomb. But David prophesied about the coming, the, his coming descendant, the Christ that would sit on his throne, that he would not be abandoned to the grave. His body would not see decay. He spoke prophetically about the resurrection of Christ. He says, and we are witnesses to this, to this fact, in verse 32, going on, exalted the right hand of God, and uh, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. He has poured out on what you see, now see it here. So he's saying that all of what's happening is a product of what David also foresaw in the Christ. Just as Christ came into this world conceived by the Holy Spirit, the church is conceived by the Holy Spirit. Jesus operated in, and was accredited to people in the miraculous by doing the signs and wonders and miracles. He accredited. He also is accrediting his church to the world by signs and miracles and wonders. Through what? This outpouring of the Holy Spirit that you're seeing now. Why does he use David? He references David. Why do you think he, Peter referenced David to the people? Because the people referenced, or they, they reverenced, they respected who David was. And David said this about this man that they had crucified. In other words, he's going, you goofed. You crucified the Messiah. And David, this person that you respect, I know you'll listen to his words. He said this man that you crucified was the Messiah. And he prophesied hundreds of years in advance that he would not remain in the grave. He would not see decay, but he would be resurrected. And guess at this point, guess what's happened? Jesus has been resurrected. And he is now he has just, just ascended to the right hand of God, which David said he would do. He's putting the stamp of approval on all of proof on all of these things. And saying, as weird as you think today is, with the wind and the tongues of fire and speaking in tongues, 
All of this was prophesied about, and that's what's happening. And we today, 2,000 years later, are still carrying on in this same vein, in this we. This is still us. This is still them. We are still them just 2,000 years later. And we should, we should take a confidence in that. <clears throat> People that think that you know this Christianity is just like a fairy tale, some kind of weird myth. How does prophecies that happened hundreds and thousands of years late in you know ago? get fulfilled by people who have no knowledge of those prophecies. How does that happen? If it's just a myth, if it's just a fairy tale, how does that happen? Well, the answer is that it happens because it's not a myth, it's not a fairy tale, it's true. The reason Peter's explaining this to these people is because they don't know this or they don't get it. They haven't connected the dots. Remember last week when I said I love the Bible because it's like a puzzle and you get all these pieces and you put them together. It's like, oh my gosh, what's the picture, the picture that it paints? Maybe they kind of knew this, but they hadn't connected the dots. So Peter's telling them because this is their, this is their, uh, their one of their great you know fathers, if you will, uh, lineage wise of the Jewish people. He was King David, and they respect him, they revere him, and he prophesied about this very thing that they're seeing happen. So they're going, oh, okay. And it, 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 it works in this case because we know later on that there's a, they, they, they repent, okay? So let's, so let's go let's go on. Um, it says that, before, before I go, to, it says that um, Jesus, in verse 33, is exalted to the right hand of, of God, and the Holy Spirit has now been poured out as he promised, right? Is on the right hand of God. He, is, um, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you see now see and hear. So, he's, so Jesus is ascended to the right hand of God, and the Holy Spirit is poured out now that he's left and he's ascended. I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you think it'd be great to have Jesus still walking the earth today? Anybody think it'd be great to have Jesus still walking the earth today? Can I tell you something? You are mistaken. We are better off to have Jesus at the right hand of God interceding for us, which is what it says he lives continually to intercede on our behalf. And the, his, and the Holy Spirit here who can be with every one of us simultaneously instead of one man just walking around and maybe you come into contact with him and maybe you don't. That's my take on it, all right? As much as we think, and I agree, it'd be amazing to see Jesus face to face. We're better off. I think God's plan, the way he planned it, is probably better. See, how he never makes mistakes. But what that says to me is we should understand how blessed and how privileged we are that God gave us. We live in a time where God has given us something better than Jesus' physical presence. Now, I, I will confess, I don't always understand and appreciate that. Sometimes I go through my day, but that's what the Bible teaches us. We are better off today than Jesus physically being here. Do we understand how privileged and blessed we are? <clears throat> this sermon isn't going anything like I thought. Shocker. <clears throat> But you know what that tells me? Hopefully it's God that's talking to you through a jackass. You know, God, God did speak Maybe. through jackasses, right? It's good for a man to know himself. All right? I just don't need you to amen me when I say that, that's all. So... <laughs> Acts 2.36 through 39. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. What do those words mean? Well, we know what Lord means. It means he's in charge. 
The word Christ means anointed. He's the anointed one of God. So he made this man that you that you thought should be crucified on a cross. He's actually your Lord, and he's anointed to be Lord and to, you know, do all these things that he's supposed to do. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? In other words, they were convicted. <clears throat> Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So, one of the things is, what's happening is when Peter is telling them about this outpouring of the promised Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is doing one of the very things he is supposed to do. Convicting them of their sin, of their mistake that they made by crucifying Jesus. Because John 16, 7 and 8 says, But I tell you the truth, it is, good, uh, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor, who we know that is the Holy Spirit, Mother's passions, will not come to you. But if, he, but if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. So here we have Jesus saying in John 16, the very thing that we're reading about here, that it's good that I go away. I'm ascending the right hand of God. And what I do, I'll send the promise of the Holy Spirit. And that's really good for you because when he does come, he'll bring conviction to the world. And these people are doing what? They're being convicted. We can't repent unless we are first convicted. Because unless we have conviction come to us, we don't know that there's anything to repent of. So being repentance, being convicted, and then repenting, that's not a, a negative, that's a positive. We might not like conviction, but it's for our good so that we can repent and then be found to be righteous, to be blameless. If you want the reference, it's John 14, 26, it tells us that the Counselor and the Holy Spirit are one and the same person. Wow. Wow. I have three and a half or four more pages of notes. I'm not going to even attempt that. So how are we going to, how are we going to wrap this up? Let's just go on. I'll go a little bit farther and I'll figure a way to wrap it up. Acts 2 verse 40. Acts 2, verse 40. It says, With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So 3,000 people got saved because of what Peter explained to them. And they received the conviction that the Holy Spirit brought. They said, What should we do? He tells them, Repent and be baptized. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So they're doing this. And once they've now done this, verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Let me just pause right there. In other words, they repented, and then they, they received more teaching for more understanding. And guess what they did? What are the, what's kind of describing? They kept meeting together as a church. Doesn't say they want. Oh, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching on Facebook and watched the videos they posted on YouTube. Oh no, oh, I didn't say that, does it? Now all of you are mad at me, but there's somebody going to be out there watching later on that's going to be mad at me. That's okay. I I'm on God's side. All right. He is describing that they are meeting together, as we're told in Hebrews 10, 25, don't stop meeting together, and they're benefiting from it. They're growing because of it. Everyone was filled with awe, and the many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together and with glad and sincere hearts. 
Pray to God and enjoy the favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Because they were continuing to, they were meeting together as a body. Because they were being uh, receiving instruction. Because they were were praying together and just being together and supporting one and supporting one another. I, I, I just to say, you're supporting one another. It's important that we do this. Um, I reference somebody asked, "What's a holy kiss?" The Bible talks about a holy kiss. I, I mean. I'm assuming we, every somebody I see practice it just to, you know, kiss somebody on the cheek or something. I would just let you know I don't wholly kiss women that are my wife, all right? But the Bible still says to do that. But they're being together. They're supporting each other. They're encouraging each other. They're, they're, they're lifting each other up. You know, if they need a hug, they get a hug. If they need a holy kiss, they get a holy kiss. If they need prayer, they get a prayer. If they need other needs met, they, they, they meet those needs. And we do that when we join together like this. That's why I'm, we're going to continue to take, folks, I don't want it to, to go on all day long. We're not going to have a banquet here. But you don't have to, when we get our coffee and a donut, you don't have to rush back to your seat. We come together like this, but when we just, when we, I just really, you know, God really had to hit me upside the head. It's like, Randy, you're preaching on being the church and being the body and being there to build each other up, and yet you're only making time for people to come and sit down and get a sermon and get up and leave. Okay? That's not conducive to joining together and encouraging each other and giving each other a hug and a holy kiss and all that. So don't feel like you got to rush back to your seat. But it's more than just even here because you... Give of your tithes and your offering. We, 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 the church can meet people's needs when they're going through tough times. And I'm so excited that we've been able to do that recently with somebody that was going through a really tough time. And we as a church, because you give, it's you that did it. We talk about the church. Well, you're the church. Well, we help somebody through a really tough time. It's not me that did it. It's not the church. It's not th this building that did it. It's you that did it. Because you give them your tithes and your offering. When people have needs, we can help them. And now they got a new job coming up. And awesome. Praise God. That's why we're, this is so important. And when we do that, what does it say? They were adding to their number daily. And that's what I believe. I think if we'll just be the church as we see it in Scripture, God will add to our our. And I don't say just to add to our numbers. It, it's, it impacts more and more people. That's what we're called. We're called to impact the people that we come into contact with on a daily basis for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's what God wants us to do. So all of this to say, it's not me saying, it's Peter saying it. And through Peter, God is saying, listen carefully. I'm explaining to you what this whole church thing is all about. This is what it's all about. Amen? I, I was going to stop right here because I think I like ending on the idea that 3,000 got saved and God was adding to their number daily as they just simply acted like the church, like God intended them to be. And, and, and the beauty of it is we can receive the teaching from God's word, but we can also receive empowerment from the Holy Spirit to put it into practice, and that's what God wants.